Amazon is a pay to play platform. If you're not driving clicks and sales, two important things that feed that algorithm, then you're going to lose. Let's be honest. It's easy to make mistakes selling on Amazon if you aren't prepared nor experienced because it's so different from other sales channels. It's easy to get frustrated and to walk away from Amazon. In the last episode, we did some myth busting. And today, we're going to talk about top Amazon mistakes that we hear day in and day out. I'm Jason Boyce, founder and CEO of Avenue 7 Media and host of the Day 2 Podcast. And with me today is Shannon Roddy, Amazon strategist, educator, and business development lead for Avenue 7 Media. Shannon, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jason. I was so excited when we decided to do this episode <laughs> because I think there's so much pain that sellers uh, you know, encounter when it comes to selling on Amazon. And like you said, you know, in our last episode, we, co we covered myths. In this episode, we're going to cover the biggest Amazon mistakes. And we see these repeatedly, but most brands and sellers are making them for the first time. And honestly, Jason, if I have a key takeaway to start the episode with, it's that a majority of the mistakes that sellers and brand owners make are predictable and avoidable. And that's where we come in. I and mean, that's where the podcast is so valuable to educate, to help people avoid those mistakes. We help our clients avoid those mistakes because we know what they are before people even make them. And Jason, I'm curious. I mean, I would say that on average, if there's a new brand selling on Amazon, I could probably guess seven out of the first 10 mistakes that they're going to make selling on the platform. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I've been doing this for 20 years, Shannon. I've made more mistakes than any other seller out there. I'm convinced of it. I challenge you, if you're a <laughs> seller, seller that's out there, if you have made more mistakes than I have on this platform, then bring it on. I'd love to get you on the podcast in here, but I, I doubt if you're out there. Well, you know, my, as my dad always says, you know, when you do everything right, you don't learn anything. So when you make mistakes, you learn from them. And our goal is to use this podcast to educate uh, the brands and listeners out there to help them avoid these really critical mistakes. So Jason, let's dive right in. Um, let's start with one of the most pressing uh, mistakes or group of mistakes that sellers can make. And that's when it comes to sellers coming in thinking that they can game the system, violate terms of service, or even break the law. What, what are we dealing with here? What are sellers doing that are just absolutely, in some cases, catastrophic to their account or their brand? Yeah, Shannon, that's a great one. That last one is really important. I think there's a lot of folks out there that are breaking the law and they don't even know it. So we're going to clarify for them today. And look, again, I should tell you guys, I've done all this stuff, right? I did it all before it was against TOS, sometimes after it, after it was against TOS. And um, you know, when I talk about the things that violate TOS, which stands for Terms of Service, I speak from experience. And, and here are some of them, Shannon fake reviews. I'm just going to buy some reviews out there. I'm going to go find a Facebook group. No one's going to find out, Shannon. No one's going to know that I just you know, violated a federal law that's sort of punishable by a fine that could ruin my financial future. But fake reviews is a big one and it's still going on. Ranking tricks and rebates. Look, rebates is another one where you give away a free product in exchange for a real live full price purchase on Amazon to spike the organic ranking algorithm. We talked in the last episode about how important that algorithm is. Well, rebates mm -hmm. is a way to spike that. Amazon just came out with some very important uh, information recently that specifically outlaws this practice. I've done it, Shannon. I've done it. I would never do it again, but I have. You know, another one is, is GS1 UPC codes. I still am amazed at folks that don't go to the GS1. Is it gs1us.org website? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. thank you. The GS1 and we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> thank you. Great. I, I didn't even know we had show notes. This is exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they don't just go to the source to get their UPC codes. To save, you know, 25 cents, 75 cents, a dollar, they go and they buy resold UPC codes that just don't work on Amazon anymore and you can't use them. You know, this is a good one. I read this article. I read an article about some guy in San Diego that had sold about $1.5 million of Amazon product and never shipped it. He just kept creating different seller accounts and uh, that guy's in jail. Um, and so, you know, there's so many ways where I think young sellers who don't understand just how knowledgeable Amazon is, just how much data they have on you that think that they can be smarter than them and trick the system. Yeah, it's, it's so true. I mean, and, you know, the rebate thing, for example, you know, we were at Prosper show, Jason, and one of the booths I visited, 
they specifically laid out their process of getting people to buy your products and leave reviews. I mean, it was blatant review manipulation and uh, ranking manipulation. And honestly, I think there's a lot of good intention brands that don't even know the difference. They don't even know they're doing it. You have to be so educated to make sure that you're not just toying the line, but actually playing playing on the safe side. Because if Amazon takes you down, oftentimes it's it's permanent or semi-permanent. Um, so you've got to really be uh, knowledgeable about what those actual terms of service are, what the actual policies are. And, and as you and I both know, Amazon will sometimes enforce things that are not explicitly stated in their terms of service. So you've got to know what the gray areas are, right? I mean, you've got to know in between, be able to read in between the lines in some cases. Yeah, and you know, we 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 warn against this all the time. Don't pay attention to the YouTube videos, <laughs> unless it's the, <laughs> unless it's the day two podcast uh, video, of course, and and our YouTube TV channel. But there's so many hucksters out there that are pushing stuff that will get people suspended, fined, or put in jail. And you know, there was one that I didn't bring up yet, Shannon, and this is a big one. And there's going to be a federal court case going public in the fall of this year, where several Amazon folks in the business as an, on an agency side and otherwise were bribing Amazon employees to get them to do things like uh, give beneficial treatment to their listings, but also take down their competitors in a way that, that preference their business. And so at the end of the day, if you wouldn't want to tell your mom about this or your dad about what you were doing, it's probably not a good thing to do. That's a good rule of thumb that I like to use. If I wouldn't want my mom to hear that I was doing it, I'm not going to do it. But, but so much of this stuff, fake reviews, I don't think a lot of people realize this, but according to the FTC, fake, fake reviews is illegal and can wow. get you fined. I haven't heard of any examples of jail term, but I've heard of some very large fines from folks who are doing this. And the funny thing is, is there was a period of time uh, back when I was selling on Amazon where you were allowed to give away product in exchange for, and this language had to be at the bottom of the review, a yeah, fair, that. unbiased review. Now, I don't know how that works. I don't know how you get free <laughs> product and offer a fair, unbiased review, but it was allowed at one time, right? And even- We, we did it. Yeah. All of our clients did it back in the day. Yeah. I mean- you know, that, that's the one thing that, that is really positive from my perspective about Amazon. So much of these types of things, fake reviews, rebates, um, you know, being dumb with not using a real UPC code, try, you know, literally committing fraud by selling products and not shipping and then trying to bribe officials. You know, Amazon is sharpening their focus and their clarity on the terms of service to make it painfully obvious. If you are a seller and or you are a brand, I highly recommend reading that terms of service. Look, if you have trouble sleeping one night, just read it every <laughs> night before you go to bed. It'll put you to sleep. But it's really important, right? Yeah. It's really important to know what you're getting yourselves into. And just because some Yahoo on YouTube or TikTok says this is the coolest, greatest trick to become a top seller, I guarantee you. I guarantee you that either the FTC or Amazon will come after you and you'll wish you never did it. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, and GS One has done a great job of making UPC acquisition much easier and much more cost effective. In fact, last year they launched the single G10, so you can buy a single GS One UPC code if you just got one product. If you're an inventor, you can buy a single G10 for about thirty five dollars. So get legitimate GS One UPC codes. Don't buy reseller, even if they claim they're legal. It's not the point. Uh, Amazon tracks it now, and they want to track that back to your GS One account. So, Shannon, just one more thing about about these kinds of violations. If you do happen to find yourself on the wrong side of the law, maybe, well, get a lawyer if you're on the wrong side of the law, but on the <laughs> wrong side, if you're on the wrong side of TOS and you do get your account suspended, even if it was on purpose or by accident, or your listing gets taken down and you can't get it live and you don't know what to do, I'm gonna give a shout out to our folks at Avenue 7, Rachel Greer and Malia on our team, our masters at helping our managed clients get these problems resolved. Um, not only can we do it, one of our favorite agencies that we refer out to all the time is e-commerce Chris. Chris McCabe, who's been in this game for a long time, and Leah, they are amazing at helping you solve this problem. So e-commerce Chris or avenue7media.com can help you with these problems, and we can also help get you on the straight and narrow. All right, Jason. The second group of mistakes that we see brands make all the time is failing to defend and protect their brand on Amazon. And this is critical because as we talked about last week, Amazon is the most valuable real estate in e-commerce. If you're not defending or protecting your brand, it's like building a beautiful castle with you know crystal chandeliers and leaving the front door open. 
Let's talk about some of the ways in which brands fail to defend uh, and protect their brands on the Amazon platform. Look, number one, not securing or your trademark or other IP is sort of a foundational piece, I think, Shannon. If you are doing the right thing and being on Amazon in the right way and you want to protect your brand, get that trademark. Amazon has the IP accelerator. You can Google it, IP, Amazon IP accelerator that will help you get that trademark and then quickly get the benefits of brand registry that comes along with that. But more importantly, if there's some other joker out there who's copying your name that you've built and, and, and created a brand behind, then you have the power once your brand registered to go out and submit violations within the Amazon system. If you've created a better mousetrap that no one's ever done before, get that design patent. You know, get that utility patent. So again, so that you can knock folks off of Amazon who are ripping off of your innovation. And so I think that's a big one. Absolutely. Um, one of the other things, and this is probably one that I get the most pushback from brands, is not defending your brand keywords when it comes to advertising. Break that down for us because, I mean, I've got some thoughts yeah. on this, but... I see people push back. They go, no, people are searching for my brand. They want to buy my brand. They're going to scroll past all these other ads of competitors and buy only my product. Yeah. I, I, Why is that a mistake to not do that? No, Shannon, you're right. It's a mistake not to do it. But I also understand why these brands are pissed when they have to pay for their own registered trademark brand keywords, right? I don't, right. I, I mean, and, and Amazon's not alone in this. Google does it and others. You know, if I could wave my magic wand and be put in charge for a day, I, one of the rules that I would change is if you're an online platform and somebody comes and advertises on your platform and you have a registered trademark, then that trademark is yours within your category and no one else can advertise on it. So I understand yeah. their frustration, Shannon. It pissed sure. me off when I used to have to defend my brand. <laughs> but if you don't do it, if you don't defend your brand keywords, guess what you're doing? You're letting others and sometimes folks from a China factory or Amazon itself take this key vital real estate above the fold on the search results page and, and feed off of your brand name in order to sell their product, not yours. So you just, you just have to suck it up. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll hug it out. All of us agree yeah. that this is a terrible thing that you have to do, but you got to do it. You got to protect that valuable real estate for yourself. Yeah. And I, you know, from my experience, it's the lowest cost per click. It's the highest conversion rate. It's going to be the lowest tacos or a cost of your advertising and all of your advertising spend. But people tend to overestimate the loyalty of their customers. And, and the second thing is we don't know the intent. If I search for a brand name of a particular shoe, I don't, you know, as a brand owner, you don't know if I bought that shoe religiously for the last 10 years or if somebody mentioned it in a conversation, they said, oh, go look this up on Amazon. I have no brand loyalty at that point. And the reason we know this works, Jason, is because our clients make boatloads of money advertising on competitor brand names. We know it works. So if you're not defending your brand, somebody else is just going to, it's easy money to, to just capitalize on that. So yeah. um, absolutely like, agree. Yeah, absolutely, Shannon. And then another one here uh, in terms of um, under the heading of, you know, not defending or protecting your brand as being in, in that, not doing that as a mistake is when you do find competitors who are violating your intellectual property, your IP, aggressively file those violations. Amazon has done a, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to use the word good, Shannon. I'm going to say Amazon has done an okay job <laughs> developing a system within Seller Central and within Brand Registry in order to report violations against your IP. And so they built it, use it. Don't let others rip off your innovations, stuff that belongs to you. So I think, you know, a lot of folks, I sometimes hear brands just complaining about it and they're not really doing anything yeah. about it. Um, and so take action. Yeah. Once you have the trademark, once you have the patent, use it. Um, Jason, this is another huge one. We're talking about, it's called different things by different people, but channel control, um, brand protection, distribution enforcement, right? So selling to distributors, without a channel control strategy. Break that down for us of why that's such a big mistake if brands don't do this proactively before they get big on Amazon. Oh, this one deserves a big exhale, Shannon. I've, I've had so <laughs> many of these conversations from legacy brand owners who built a multi-million, $100 million business, $500 million business by making a great product, coming up with a wholesale price and selling it to distributors and other uh, you know, resellers or buying groups. And it was great. 
it was a great strategy. It was a great way to get your product placement on shelves, uh, placement in, in even online stores. But here's the problem. On Amazon, it creates a total mess. And look, I, I have to give credit where credit is due. James Thompson, my good friend, wrote the book, literally wrote the book on channel control because he's seen the power of, of how this can happen um, and how this can improve uh, sales, brand integrity, uh, and the ability of brands to put their brand in the best possible light. Do not, I repeat, do not let somebody else attach to the hard work that you've put into your own listings on Amazon. There is exactly zero value in you creating best in class listings, best branded experience on your Amazon listings, and then allowing somebody else to come in and attach to those listings. It just makes no sense on Amazon. And, the, the, and the, it can be you know, harmful as well. You don't get clean data. You don't know what your true conversion rates are. You don't know what your true attribution model is. You have no idea really if you paid for an ad and then some other joker who attached to your listings got the sale. You just don't know. And so one of the best things, especially that big brands can do, Shannon, is clean up that channel. And again, you know, here at Avenue 7 Media, we can put you in contact with the right legal minds um, and, and, and help brands clean that channel up so that this is really important so that they are the only seller of their brand in the buy box. I'll stand by it. I'm going to put it on my yeah. headstone uh, someday, <laughs> Shannon. It's really, really important. And, you know, I'd like to give you an example. You know, we work with a terrific pet supply company and, you know, they didn't, they, they were allowing others through a distributor network to sell and attach to their listings. Additionally, they weren't branding their keywords. They weren't paying for their branded keywords and they weren't defending that brand. Their listings were meh. You know, we came in, we started working with them and within six months, we had cleaned up the channel. We'd started defending their brand because they had a great product. They had a couple of hero products where everyone was searching for their brand within their subcategory. So we, we, we staked a claim to that real estate on the search results page and other places. And they, they've just had accelerated growth in the thousands of percent year over year. And so that's a great example. They were, they were ready to give up, Right. They, we talked about this on item number one. They were ready to give up on Amazon because they hated Amazon. I don't blame them. They couldn't figure it out. They couldn't crack the code. But we came in. We took a look at their brand. We branded their listings. We laid the SO, SEO. We do all the things that we do. And then we defended them. We defended their brand, made them the only seller in the buy box. And these guys are a seven-figure seller now. Jason, the, the number one sort of argument that I hear from brands. And I refuse to, you know, when I had my marketplace seller courses and did consulting and coaching, I refused to work with companies that didn't do channel control because it was it was a loss. You lose detail page control, you lose the buy box, people mess things up. Um, the number one thing that I noticed more than anything else was that fear was prevented preventing them from doing channel control. They were so afraid. Oh, but if I tell this person they can't sell on Amazon, they're gonna shut me down in all their retail stores. Probably not. Or if they are, it's because all the sales that they were saying they were getting elsewhere, they were just selling on Amazon anyways. And so I think we've got another great example about that of people have this fear mindset of I'm so scared to kick off resellers because I'm afraid I'm going to lose all of those sales. But we've got some case studies that actually defy that and show the truth of what, what can actually happen when you do it correctly. You're absolutely right. Uh, fear is no strategy. And what we find day in and day out is when we get those brands to shut down those distributors or resellers, they pick up the full retail value of those sales on Amazon, and it more than makes up for whatever they're losing on the wholesale side to, to some of these folks. And you know, here's a good litmus test, Shannon. If you go to a reseller or a distributor and they start complaining and say, if you guys don't allow me to sell your brand on Amazon, I'll lose all of my sales. Yeah. If they say that, <laughs> the response should be, then why the f do I need you? Right? <laughs> there's no reason, there's no reason to have somebody who's only selling on Amazon because you can do a better job of it, especially if you if you have the right pro partners or the right staff. Well, let's speaking of staff, um, Jason, let's talk about that because again, we go back four, five, six, seven years, and people say, you know, I hired an Amazon guy. Um, in fact, when I was at Fancy Food Show a couple of years ago. That was the line that we say, oh, we got an Amazon guy. You know, we have an <laughs> Amazon guy. And then you find out how they're actually doing it. And you look at their listings and how terrible they are. You look at the lack of defensiveness or the lack of channel control. And you go, yeah, that's obviously not going to work. Maybe part of the problem is you didn't hire an Amazon gal. Like, 
uh, you know, maybe maybe there's some diversity that needs to happen there. But um, the bigger p point is that you can't just hire one or two people. It's gotten too big. It's too complex. And I, I, I just want to take a second to highlight all of the departments, for example, that we have at Avenue 7 to really provide our full service clients with everything they need because just having an advertising person isn't going to work if Amazon takes your listings down. Can you walk us through all of those different pieces that somebody actually needs to be successful? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, our, our amazing COO, Angela Murphy, says it best. It takes a village. It literally takes a village in order to have success on Amazon. We've got 10 different departments, Shannon, doing this. We've got a research and reporting department. We've got a copywriting department. We've got a graphic design department a video editing department. We've got an advertising department that is very deep, right? That that has yeah. multi, a multitude of capabilities on it because the advertising complexity on Amazon is only getting greater by the, by the minute seemingly. Yeah. Uh, we have a customer service department that helps respond within 24 hours, 24 seven, 365. Because if you don't, again, it's a good way to get suspended. We've got a customer engagement department that helps with um, Amazon posts and followers and building up that following within that walled garden within Amazon. We've got an FBA and inventory management department. That's always fun these days, especially post COVID, making sure that what you send to Amazon is what they receive, identifying how much to send, not not too much, not too little, because right. both are bad for both reasons. We've got a compliance department and we've got a suspension and reinstatements department. And so yeah. I'm sorry, but your guy or gal who just graduated from college can't do all that stuff. You yeah, can't look at Amazon as just a sales channel that, you know, as it was 15 years ago, where you can hire a person to just throw some mediocre listings up and have success. Those days are gone. Um, you've got to treat it with respect and you've got to either hire a legitimate team. And I'm not saying you need to hire 10 people, but you probably need to hire four or five people who are sure. experienced Amazon operators so that they don't make these mistakes that we're telling you not to make yourself. Or you need to hire an agency who can get this done for you. Yeah. And just remember in this day and age, there's no qualification for Amazon. Anybody can put up a website and say that they're an expert at Amazon in anything. <laughs> so uh, keep that in the back of your mind. Um, uh, listeners. So Shannon, I just want to add one more thing. You know, one thing that's nice, we, we do talk to brands all the time that will have an Amazon person on their staff. And I, I always love the look on their face. Once we tell them all the things that we'll take care of for them, they're like, oh, thank you for being here. <laughs> Some of them can be really nervous that we're going to replace them. It actually works really well for us as an agency. When we have someone with some basic understanding and knowledge of Amazon, we right. work with them to, to provide them all of the support that they need so that they can look good in front of their boss and be that window and uh, the, the the person within the organization that keeps their bosses up to date. So, you know, we're not trying to replace anyone on staff, um, yeah. but uh, you know, I, I always love it when they say thanks, thanks for thanks for taking this <laughs> off my plate. Yeah, another big mistake, Jason, that we see a lot of times is expecting that Amazon's going to help you, that they're going to be there for you, that they're going to walk you through stuff. That when you have a problem you can get a hold of Amazon and they're going to walk you through it. Why is that a mistake? What do, what do brands who go in with that mindset wind up encountering? It's kind of like going up to the Borg and Star Trek and saying, Hey, will you help me with this problem? No, it's just Amazon is not your friend, right? They are an enormous company with more than a million workers. Think about that for a second. They have a million people with an Amazon paycheck that they get every two weeks or how, whatever their payment cycle is. That's not even counting the, the litany of contractors, probably a half a million more who are contract delivery drivers that show up with the Amazon smiley logo at your door every day. And so they are a really enormous company. And after all of that, Shannon, they're one of the most understaffed companies in the world wow. because they, they, they can't get it done. That's why they employ so much artificial intelligence so much AI bots, so much machine learning in every aspect of what they do to help maintain their profitability and to help grow and manage half a billion SKUs. You know, when in the history of the world has there ever been a platform that had to manage half a billion SKUs? So no, Amazon's not going to help you. And, and, and if anyone, and, and there are cases, Shannon, we, we have these weekly where there's a really bad problem and we need to contact someone on behalf of our clients at Amazon to help solve a problem. Sure. Um, and we know who to talk to, 
and we know which department to go to. And we many times will tell them what the solution is because the person we're talking to now has been in role for two months because the other person that we were talking to is now gone. And so there's a way in order to get help from Amazon, but it requires some inside baseball knowledge in order to get it done. And you know, if you think you're going to have a relationship with Amazon, you're wrong. If you think someone over there is going to be your friend, you're wrong. They're just too friggin' busy. No one's going to help you over there. You got It's a DIY platform. You're, it's do it yourself. And that goes double if you're a vendor central selling to Amazon or seller central, which we, which we prefer. And I think a lot of businesses, especially new brand owners who are launching on Amazon, make the mistake of, I'm an Amazon customer and I love the platform. It's so easy. And every time I have a problem, <laughs> I pick up the phone, I'm going to sell on Amazon. And Jason, I have had coaching clients literally call me in tears, ready to shut down their Seller Central account that they didn't even finish getting set up. They couldn't even get it approved because of the level of frustration. And if I'll, I'll just highlight it here, but Jason, you know, if, if every brand or manufacturer or, you know, seller out there said, if there's one thing I would change on Amazon, it would be that I could pick up the phone and call somebody. And you can't, you can't, you can't do no. that. Um, well, you, you can sometimes get somebody on the phone who won't be able to help you, which is more frustrating, I think, than being able to speak to somebody. <laughs> yeah. And even if you have to, there's, there's a way to go about it, knowing who to contact, when and how. I'd like to give an example of this, you know, Amazon being a DIY platform and why you have to forget everything you know about retail. We talked about that in the last episode. Birkenstock is the example that immediately pops into my head. And I remember, you know, I don't know how many years ago, Shannon, it was probably five or six years ago now, there was a big story. Birkenstock said, screw you, Amazon. We're taking our marbles. We're, we're leaving this playground and you can't sell Birkenstocks anymore on amazon.com. We will yeah, show you, right? You remember that? Well, guess that. what? To this day, if you go to Birkenstock, there's like, you know, 5,000 listings of Birkenstock that don't look very good. And so here's an example where Birkenstock came into, came into the relationship with Amazon thinking that it would be like selling to some of their regional stores their, or, their, or their shoe stores and that they would be taken care of as a brand and that the brand would market for them and they would do all these things for them and to help sell that their product. Amazon doesn't care so much about Birkenstock and they're not going to do that. If Birkenstock CEO had come into this and understood, okay, whether I'm vendor central or seller central, Amazon is a do-it-yourself platform. We need to staff up or we need to work with an agency. And we know that we're going to have to make ourselves winners on the Amazon platform, clean the channel and do all that stuff. If he had come in with that mindset, he'd probably be able to knock off all of the jokers that are on there right now, keep the channel clean get all the great clean data and be an amazing seller on Amazon. Instead, he just didn't get it. And so I, I, yeah. I you know, I like to look back on Birkenstock and say, come on, man, I wish he could have just called me back then before he made that announcement to the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. You look at how long it took. It's, it's taken Apple to clean up. I mean, Apple is notorious for counterfeits and, you know, Apple certified. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not <laughs> Apple certified, but it is exciting to see brands who can do this well, who do clean up the channel, do protect their brand um, and understand how Amazon works. Yeah. Uh, Jason, the last uh, mistake that I want to cover um, is, you know, I think probably Field of Dreams is responsible for this. It's their fault. If you list it, sales will come. I love that reference, Kevin Costner. Um, you know, if you build it, they will they will come. No, that they only won't. belongs in Hollywood. It does not <laughs> apply to Amazon. Uh, look, guys, Amazon is a pay to play platform. If you're not driving clicks and sales, two important things that feed that algorithm that that algorithm that's on Amazon, then you're going to lose. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got to be different, you've got to be better, but you've also got to drive traffic and you must know that you've got to pay for a traffic. You've got to get it. And look, you know, we've got a brand in the marine industry, uh, that was spending, you know, less than 2% of their sales to drive ads to their listings. It was a sizable business. We're talking big, you know, seven figure a year business right here. Thought they were doing great. Um, we signed them on as a client. We went in and took a look at their ads console and built out an effective campaign uh, ad group strategy um, and started driving a lot more ads to each and every one of their ASINs. We took that 2% of ad sales, 2% uh, tacos, if you will, that media efficiency rate up to about 10% and we've quadrupled their sales and they're very happy with it. 
So originally, yeah. you know, the folks that were managing their advertising before, they thought, oh, you know, we're a special brand name. And they are. They're a great brand name. They're well known in the industry. If you've got a boat, you know this company's name. Sure. But they were resting on their laurels instead of playing the Amazon game the right way. You got to pay for it. It's pay to play now. I don't like it, but that's the way it is. And to the tune of four times 4X top line revenue sales, you know, our, our contact at that company is doing the I told you so dance with his boss right now. And he's enjoying every minute of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, when 80% plus of uh, the search terms that come through Amazon are unbranded, you've got to go after that generic space. And Absolutely. so um, really, really key. Jason, I'm so excited we were able to do this podcast together. Why don't you go ahead and just recap the things that we talked about? What sort of the biggest highlight of the biggest mistakes that brands make on Amazon and then let them know if they're having these problems and don't know where to turn to, where they can turn to. Yeah, look, I, I just want to reiterate, if you're making these mistakes, please don't feel bad. I've made them many more times than you had and learned the hard way. You know, I've got lumps on my forehead from banging my head up against a brick wall for 17 years before cracking the code on Amazon. So please don't feel bad. But look, in the final analysis, you have to be on Amazon. 56% of online market share in the United States, be there. Uh, you have to defend your brand. Yeah, it pisses me off too that you have to pay for your own branded keywords. Trust me, just do it. Aggressively protect your, your intellectual property. Go after all of that branded real estate. Make sure that it's yours so that your brand awareness that exists in the marketplace can be taken advantage of by you, not by your competitors. You must be the only seller in the buy box. Don't be nice to anybody. Don't let anyone else attach to your hard work. You're not going to get good metrics and you're not going to have the same level of success if you're the owner of the buy box only. Um, follow the rules. Read that TOS. Um, you know, if you need to put, if you have trouble sleeping one night, read TOS. It'll help you go to sleep. But you've got to read it and you got to know what the rules are. I guarantee you that you cannot be smarter than Amazon. And also, pay very close attention to real laws that can get you in deep, deep trouble. I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want you to end up behind bars because of something that you think is a trick on Amazon. Um, and then lastly, treat Amazon with respect, staff your team appropriately, a person, you're not setting them up for success if you put a person in charge of your Amazon business. Develop a, a, a team, find experienced operators or work with an agency like us. And look, if you're ready to start growing your brand on Amazon with a team of experienced Amazon operators who've been there and done that, you can reach us at day2podcast.com. That's D-A-Y, the number two, podcast.com. Lastly, if you know anyone else that would get value from this uh, Amazon selling knowledge, please share this podcast with them. Thank you and have a great day.